Here, British Columbia, Vancouver to the Highway of Tears. Over the course of many years, the number of missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls in British Columbia has grown, just as it has throughout Canada. 22-year-old Tamara Lynn Chipman was last seen near Prince Rupert on September 21, 2005. Belinda Williams was last seen in British Columbia in 1977. Tamara, from Morristown First Nation, is suspected to have gone missing from Highway 16, the infamous Highway of Tears that runs from Prince George to Prince Rupert. It is unknown where Belinda went missing from. The last time Tamara Chipman is known to have been seen was hitchhiking at an industrial park in Prince Rupert. Searches conducted from Prince Rupert to Terrace, BC have turned up little information. Almost nothing is known about the disappearance of Belinda Williams. At any time during this broadcast or afterward, if you have any information that might help solve the case of the disappearance of Tamara Chipman or Belinda Williams, visit our website. Someone out there has answers. Our goal is to find them. With more than a decade having passed in Tamara's case, and more than four decades passed in Belinda's, can any hope for justice remain? What happened to Tamara Chipman and Belinda Williams? Gladys Raddick is Tamara's aunt. She has walked across Canada five times to raise awareness for missing persons, even though she lost a leg to a hit and run accident. Gladys is motivated by her love for her niece, Tamara. Tamara is uh, my niece. Uh, she's the only child of my brother, Tom Chipman. She is um, a young lady that went missing from the Highway of Tears on September 21st, 2005. I've been looking for answers for her and many other family members for almost 11 years now. Tamara was a young mom and had a beautiful smile that her Aunt Gladys could never forget. She had a big, beautiful smile, and when she was really, really happy, her eyes would twinkle and her big smile would just brighten up her room for anybody. She was, she was a lot of fun to be around. When I see Jaden now, her son, I see him now, and he's exactly the same as her. Spit an image of her, acts like her. And that's another thing that really hurts me when I think about the kids that have been left behind. There was a time when Gladys became worried about Tamara and about all the young women and men in her family. I've always worried about all the girls, including my own. I have four daughters myself. Having been raised in the North, having been raised with such a traumatic uh, lifestyle myself, I always worried about the girls. Um, my nieces, I have some really beautiful nieces and uh, I worry about the boys too, but also, you know, because of the amount of missing and murdered women they have on the Highway of Tears, I've always worried about the girls. Tamara's case is being investigated by Project EPANA. Staff Sergeant Wayne Clary works with that task force. EPANA's investigation that was uh, undertaken at the request of senior management in the RCMP in BC I think back in 2005, they were clearly aware of the, um, the uh, homicides and the missings along Highway 16 corridor in northern BC. And, the, and in the past, there had been, you know, sort of informal groups of police taking a look, look at these investigations. But the uh, management wanted a more formal sort of um, project to, to look at those. So that was started in, uh, I believe, late 2005, early 2006. It was the beginning of it. Uh, eventually, they would settle on the 18 cases that we have today, um, five missing and, and 13 murders, and they developed criteria and, and create a task force and then move forward. Staff Sergeant Clary speaks to Tamara's case with the details as they are known to law enforcement. Well, it was uh, in September in, uh, in 2005. Uh, Tamara was uh, you know, a young single mother at the time. Tamara was I would say was heavily involved in the drug in the drug world, you know, as a user and all that other type of thing that goes along with that. She lived in Terrace. Uh, she came to Prince Rupert for a few days with with um, some associates or, or one associate. Uh, was there for a period of time, and um, I know that she was looking to to get a ride back. Uh, she wasn't able to do that. And in, uh, in, in the late afternoon, she 
she got herself up to Highway 16, uh, just east of Prince Rupert Industrial Area, and she was last seen hitchhiking. That's the last time anyone's ever seen her. Tamara's family doesn't speak of her involvement with drugs. If addictions were a factor in Tamara's vulnerability to becoming the victim of violence, Dr. Gabor Maté, one of the world's leading experts on understanding addictions, shed some light on how we can better respond to those living with addiction to make them less vulnerable. Well, if we understand the source of addiction, which is in human suffering, then what is the normal healthy response to human suffering is compassion. So any response that's not compassionate just doesn't appreciate the nature of addiction, number one. And number two, you can't help people unless you're compassionate towards them. You can't help people from a point of view of judgment, ostracization, dismissal, with a punitive attitude. You, you can't help people from that position. So whether you just want to be a human being who responds like a human being would to suffering, or whether you're somebody who's committed to helping people who are expressing their suffering and their addiction, compassion is the only reasonable and um, healthy response. Tamara's family and her son, who is now a teenager, long for any clues as to what might have happened to her. Will the people who know the answers come forward with so much time passed? Is there any hope for answers in Belinda Williams' case when all her family has to go on is a picture? And what is the connection to these cases and one of Canada's most notorious serial killers? On September 21st, 2005, 22-year-old Tamara Lynn Shipman was last seen near Prince Rupert hitchhiking in an industrial park. Her family has been tirelessly dedicated to finding answers and to advocacy work for other missing persons. Also committed to advocacy work is Lorelai Williams, the niece of Belinda Williams, who also went missing from British Columbia in 1977. Both cases may have ties to the notorious Highway of Tears that has claimed so many lives. Both cases may also have ties to Vancouver's downtown east side. If you have any information that might help solve the case of the disappearance of Tamara Chipman or Belinda Williams, visit our website. Belinda Williams' niece Lorelai grew up never knowing her aunt, but her aunt Belinda's disappearance has always been a part of her life. So my auntie went missing a few years before I was even born. What I later found out was I was the next girl born and I look like her. It's really weird how much I look like her. I was born into this. I was born into my family with a missing woman. And yeah, so this is what I grew up with. Yeah, it's pretty hard to take in. Like my family, whenever they speak of her, it, their voices shake. Tragedy struck Lorelai's family again when her older cousin, Tanya Hollick, went missing from Vancouver's downtown east side. She was my older, beautiful cousin that I looked up to. And she was the one who babysat us. You know, our families would always meet up at the baseball field. And those are the memories I have. It's always our families coming together at the park, all innocent kids just playing and enjoying life. Tanya Hollick was one of Robert Pickton's numerous victims. Author and former Vancouver police officer, Lorimer Schenner, writes about the challenges of the Picton case in his book, That Lonely Section of Hell, the botched investigation of a serial killer who almost got away. Lorimer had strong suspicions that Picton was responsible for the rash of murders from Vancouver's downtown east side, but the support from Vancouver police wasn't fast enough to save lives. For me, that was personally, um, I mean, for so many people, it was devastating as they started to find DNA from you know, woman after woman after woman who, who had been on our list. 
uh, and for me, I was I was just sick. You know, I felt a lot of personal failure that somehow I hadn't been able to uh, make enough noise to make the right things happen sooner. You know, and I had calculated how, you know, I'd looked at timelines and how many women had gone missing since essentially the fall of, of 99 was when, um, was when we really were close, should have been ramping up the Picton investigation and it, and it didn't happen um, right up until 2002. So that year and a half, by my estimation, at least 15 women were murdered who, you know, they're all a tragedy, but those ones are absolutely inexcusable because we really, really should have had them by then. Paul Assert is the co-founder of the Moose Hide Campaign, a grassroots movement of Indigenous and non-Indigenous men who are standing up against violence towards women and children. The Moose Hide Campaign was really inspired by a national gathering of organizations to end violence against Indigenous women uh, right across Turtle Island. I was privileged to be one of about 285 people at this conference. Only four of us were men. And I looked around and I had the question that I think many of our people have and many Canadians have in the space of any violence against women and specifically Indigenous women, which is, where the hell are all the men? And I, I left profoundly disturbed by what I had heard, the nature of the trauma, the raw violence and the legacy that we're living in our communities. And my daughter Raven and I went and turned to the land. We went to our home territory, the carrier territory, along the Highway of Tears, and we harvested a moose. And I was watching my daughter Raven, she was 16, clean out that moose. And we had been talking about um, the number of women that had been murdered or gone missing along that section of the highway. And uh, we kind of had a moment of um, connection, a moment of, of inspiration to take that moose hide back to our home in Victoria, tan it, cut it up into squares, um, give it to men, ask them to wear it, and um, to, uh, to begin uh, an effort of, of men to lift ourselves up and, and uh, speak up and speak out about this, uh, about this issue. Paul's daughter Raven founded the moose hide campaign with her father. It really hurts my heart to think about uh, the Indigenous women that have been mistreated or gone missing or been murdered. And I think about um, my family um, and I reflect a lot about my sisters. I have four sisters um, and one of them is my younger sister. She's eight. And just really thinking about um, her life and the safety and wanting to um, do something to make sure that she's safe and that the country that she is living in um, loves and respects her and that the people love and respect her and treat her with the respect that she deserves and thinking about um, the women that have not been treated with that love and respect. I want to do something to honor them and their lives and do something to make sure that that never happens again. Our women are labeled, they're labeled across this country drug addicts, sex worker, drunks, and it makes me angry because when the media labels them that way, or anybody in general, th this is, it's, it's stuck out there. And this is why our women are dismissed. This is why these reports aren't taken seriously. This is why our women are going missing and being murdered. For decades, families and communities have faced the loss of daughters, mothers, sisters, grandmothers, and friends. The voices of many advocates to end violence against Indigenous women and girls are coming together to raise awareness and to spark change. For Belinda Williams and Tamara Chipman, will the advocacy of their loved ones bring justice? And what is being done now to solve their cases? Linda Williams has been missing since 1977 from British Columbia. Her family has few details to go on to try to find her. 22-year-old Tamara Chipman went missing on or around September 21st, 2005. Tamara was last seen hitchhiking in an industrial park in Prince Rupert. She may have become one of the many victims of the Highway of Tears. 
if you have any information that might help solve the case of the disappearance of Tamara Chipman or Belinda Williams, visit our website. Gladys Raddick is known across Canada for her missing persons advocacy. Gladys is relentless and her walks for justice bring attention to the cases of missing women and men, girls and boys. We had people from all walks of life that walked with us because they wanted to, because they wanted to get this message across for the families because the first walk was based on a national public inquiry. The reason we asked for the National Public Inquiry was because of the family members and how many of them told us that this is what they wanted. So we said, okay, we'll put it out there for you. We'll share your stories, we'll share your families, we'll share your loved ones' stories and pictures. Henry Chevillard has been a longtime supporter of his friend Gladys and her advocacy. It was, uh, I think, Watching her, it's just basically what, what the media and the police have been telling everybody over these last years. You know, when first when the issues first started coming out in 2006, 2008, when Gladys first started her first walk, the police were saying there were just a couple hundred missing and murdered individ Indigenous women. And then a few years later, they were saying it's more than 500, you know. And then a few years later, they're saying, well, holy smokes, you know, it's more than 1,200. But Gladys and Walk for Justice and Tears for Justice have names of more than 3,500, almost 4,000. Know. And even Carolyn Bennett, the Minister of Indigenous Affairs, has alluded to that. Lorelai Williams has approached advocacy through art. Her dance troupe, Butterflies in Spirit, have done over 100 performances to raise awareness for missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls, like Lorelai's Aunt Belinda Williams and her cousin, Tanya Hollick. Lorelai will never forget their performance. We sent a message, a clear message. We incorporated the medicine wheel into our first performance, um, and we wanted to look tough. And so we had wraps, we wore um, boxing wraps to look tough, but they were in the colors of the medicine wheel. Like I wore black, another girl would wear red, another one yellow, white. And uh, one thing we did was to get the audience's attention was we took one wrap off and we whipped it and we pointed to our shirts to show their faces the women's faces, the missing and murdered women's faces. And then we linked our wraps together and we walked around in a circle. And when they were linked together it, when and walked around in a circle, it looked like a medicine wheel. Although Tanya's DNA was found on serial killer Robert Picton's farm, Picton was never convicted of her murder. He was found guilty of six counts of second degree murder and has been sentenced to six concurrent life sentences with no eligibility for parole for 25 years. Picton will not face prosecution on 20 other cases, including Tanya Hollicks. BC Crown officials chose to spare loved ones and the court system from the effort and expense of another long trial. Former Vancouver police officer, Lorimer Schenner, saw firsthand the lack of response to evidence in the murders committed by Robert Picton. Lorimer believes every case deserves the full attention of law enforcement. I have a unique perspective on it. I have been in that belly of a beast that's policing, and, and I've had a critical view of it. You know, there, there are a lot of policies in place for the police to uh, do the right thing. Um, you know, there, there, there doesn't need to be a lot of new policy written that says, do your job, do a thorough investigation, give some one person the same fulsome investigation that you would give somebody else. Belinda's family longs for an investigation. There was a recent tip and we have a possible location. And so we're trying to figure out, okay, what do we do with this? To the RCMP, this is not enough evidence to go off of. I can't say too much about that. Like, I can't say the location, I can't, because if there's somebody else out there who knows anything, you know, they want them to come forward. And I feel like, oh my God, maybe something is gonna happen. Maybe we are gonna find her. But we're up against time, because if there's any witnesses or 
any more tips, the people who would have them are dying off. Gladys Raddick will keep walking for her niece, Tamara Chipman, if there's one thing she could say to her niece. I will always tell her that I love her and I'm committed to her and finding answers for her for the rest of my life. I don't just speak for myself anymore. I speak for a nation of people that know that she's missing now. And we all pray for her that the answers will come and that we'll never give up. If you have any information that might help solve the case of the disappearance of Tamara Chipman or Belinda Williams, visit our website. <laughs>